Uh, we have six different professionals here to tell you about some interesting careers. Uh, the moderator is going to be Juliana Calkins. She's a physics major here, and she has some questions. Hi, Juliana. And uh, then she's going to invite you to ask some questions. So as they speak, be thinking about questions you'd like to ask these professionals. Now I'll turn it over to Juliana. Thank you, sir. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves one by one. So if you wouldn't mind, we can start right here. And then we'll continue on with the questions. My name is Pat Oates. I'm a civil engineer, um, and I live in Lufkin, Texas, and I have a consulting engineering firm named Goodwin Lasseter. Gregory McLean. I'm a general and colorectal surgeon. I have a practice both here and in, in Lufkin. My name is Byron Walker. I'm a software developer here in uh, Nacogdoches. Doug France. I think most of you have seen me already, but assistant professor at UT San Antonio. Chris Owens, I am a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch in Dallas. Scott Thompson, I'm an engineering manager, mechanical engineer for Lockheed Martin in Lufkin. Yes, give a round of applause. Okay, our first question for you today is, what do you do and what do you like best about your profession? Currently, I'm the uh, engineering manager for Lockheed Martin, and we develop and build electronics for uh, mu multiple missile and uh, defense systems for the U.S. military. Um, I guess for, to spell it out for y'all, I went to Texas A&M and got a degree in mechanical engineering. Whoop! And uh, graduated before most of y'all students were born, so it's been a while. <laughs> but uh, I really encourage, uh, look forward to... Uh, Working with engineers, that's, that's what I do. Uh, I hire engineers, get them trained up to do what we need them to do for a company, and uh, that's what I do. Well, I, I've been in the financial services industry a little over five years now, and spent 20 years in technology as a software engineer. Um, what I like about what I do now is it got me closer to people because what I wanted to do is really help people make a difference in what they were trying to do with their money. So I think what you're going to hear today is a lot of things about what the STEM disciplines allow you to do, but the reason I like what I do is that it lets me find out the why or the purpose for people and then also apply the tools and the how to help them get there. So you, you apply it to any, any career you choose. So um, I am a professor of chemistry, and, and what I focus on at UTSA, and, and again, I think a lot of you were at, at the talk this morning, but the great thing about being a professor, okay, and I've been in, in the pharmaceutical industry, had what you would call a, quote, real job um, at Merck, um, but what's great about being a professor uh, is not only being able to interact with, with students such as yourself and, and teaching uh, students the, the latest and greatest things about chemistry and drug discovery and, and a lot of things that go with that. But the flexibility that I have as a professor, the freedom that I have to pursue some of the things that are very interesting to me, um, was a freedom that I did not have uh, while working at Merck. And so as a chemist at Merck, the projects that came to me were basically come down from uh, the management down to me, and that was great. It was a phenomenal job. Uh, there was no question about that. But now as a professor, I get to choose some of the things that interest me. If it's something that is, is completely off basis that, I, that um, I'm just interested in, I have the opportunity to do that. I can set up my own experiments. I actually still get to go in the lab, uh, as scary as that is for my students that are in there. Um, but I get to teach at the same time. I get to travel all over the world uh, and, and, and come back to places like this and give talks. And um, so the freedom, I think, is the, the great, great thing about being in an academic position and being able to teach um, at the university level. And it's a huge, huge uh, advantage for me uh, every day when I get up to, to do those kind of things. So I'm having a blast.
Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm a software developer uh, at the company I work for right now. I do a lot of web development and mobile applications. Uh, the thing that I love best about it is I really love problem solving. It's kind of like working out a puzzle for me. When you get to the end of it, you just get this amazing feeling like, wow, I just built that and now other people are using it. Um, some other information, I guess, I'm, a, I'm graduating this year. I'm actually a student here at Stephen F. Austin and I have about six years of experience in my field. And so um, just every job that I've been to, you get this great experience and I would encourage that for all of you to start as soon as possible. What do I do and what do I like best? Well, um, I'm a general and a colorectal surgeon, so mainly um, I'm responsible for removing breast cancer, colon and rectal cancer. Um, I do hernias, things like that. What I like best for me is that people trust me to do something very, very um, important for them, especially if they have cancer. I believe they put their lives in my hands and in the hands of the good Lord. And when I'm done, I feel like I've done something that positively affects them long term. Um, we get to play with things like robots. I do a lot, of, a lot of robotic surgery. So as surgery continues to change, we try to stay on, uh, on top of that so we can continue to offer that here in East Texas. As I said before, I'm a licensed professional engineer, uh, primarily practicing in the area of municipal and civil engineering. Uh, one of the things that uh, I really like about my, <clears throat> my position, I'm, Right now, I'm the engineering director at our firm. We have 45 employees. I get to work with a wide range of both public and private clients. We do a lot of work for small cities and counties. Uh, we, our line of work, you have to be very versatile when you do the application of your engineering principles. There are general basic hard and fast rules of nature that we follow, of course but there's more than one way to design certain facilities that we do, such as we do a lot of water plants, water wells, we do public buildings, we do highways, roads, bridges. It's a, it's a very versatile uh, discipline that you can go into, and uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. I've been practicing engineering now for going on 28 years. All right, next. That's, that's good. You can, you can clap. That. <laughs> we, we have a very enthusiastic crowd. I appreciate that. Um, our next question, Pre please briefly describe how you got into your profession. When I was in high school, I had a, a great liking for doing design drafting, uh, at the time I was in high school, though, uh, there wasn't even a CAD system, I don't think, on the face of the earth. Um, so we were doing all hand drafting. Um, and then when I got into college is when CAD uh, systems first started coming out. But in, in any case, I had a, a, a great liking for that type of work uh, to uh, conceive a concept and how to design uh, a facility, whatever it may be, that we're designing, in our cases, you know, we do a lot of bridge design, for example. Uh, not only knowing how to draw that, but knowing the forces that we have to use in order to size the structure and things like that. Uh, I went from Angelina College, uh, two years there in a pre-engineering program, went to Texas A&M, got my degree there in civil engineering, uh, and you get a very wide range of exposure to different things in civil engineering, which is made up of, of uh, structural engineering, uh, environmental engineering, municipal engineering, hydraulics and hydrology. So civil engineering is a, is a very large umbrella, and there's multi-disciplines underneath that. We just happen to do, at my firm, we do a large portion of those disciplines. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how I got into the profession of medicine. When I left Wales, Texas, which is just north of Lufkin, you know, I was on a basketball scholarship to the University of Denver. And, you know, one of the mentors there was a, a, another physician, and he started taking me around. He said, what are you going to do? And I was like, you know, maybe medicine, maybe law. 
And he said, well, let me show you medicine. And, you know, as we continue to do it for the next three or four years, he mentored me, and I began to take a great loving for being able to affect people's lives. So after medical school, actually I taught for two years in the public school system, and then I had a kids' TV science show and had a great time with that. But I would often go with him on weekends to round as I got older, and I said, you know, I'm going to go back to medical school. And once I did that, my life kind of felt complete. I did my four years in Colorado, and I, did, I completed my surgery train at the University of Wisconsin. You know, the only thing bad about that, it was just so freaking cold. Um, then I went from there to uh, Florida and did a fellowship at, in Orlando. Um, but, you know, the, the best thing about surgery, again, as I said earlier, is the ability to help someone. You know, that's what a surgery allows me to do on a daily basis. How big, how small, um, I'm able to uh, affect someone's life in a, in a positive manner. A lot of how I got into my profession started with an interest at a young age. When I was very young, my father worked for a company called NEC, and they would allow him to bring some of their old parts home, and uh, I would just take them apart. Oh, by the way, NEC is a... a technology company. They design a lot of uh, technology equipment such as that projector that's up there. Um, I would take apart these things and, you know, just play around with them, try to put them back together, break the majority of them. And, <laughs> and from then, that's when I had the initial interest. And once I got to high school, I actually went to a magnet school that had a technology program. That's where I was able to learn how to program in my first year of high school and second year of high school as well. And I just carried on over through college and then I started finding jobs uh, with that sort of field in mind. And that was how I got to where I am today. For me, it's very simple. There were two events in my life that happened that made me become a chemist. So I originally wanted to come to SFA to play football. Uh, I loved playing high school football. I was fast. I was pretty fast. I was actually uh, enjoyed football. But unfortunately, my senior year, I blew out my knee um, and had six surgeries on my left knee. So football was out of the question for me. I came to SFA as a pre-med. Uh, I thought I wanted to go uh, become a doctor. And then I took organic chemistry at SFA, and that is the second reason why I became a chemist. And it's because of a person that was actually here at my talk today, Dr. Jim Garrett, um, who taught organic chemistry here at SFA for almost 37 years. This individual is the one person that is uh, the sole reason why I became a chemist. Uh, he changed my life dramatically, and I will not advocate this pathway um, to anyone, but when I took organic chemistry as a chemistry major here at SFA, the first time I took his class, I made a D. Not very good. And now here I am a professor teaching organic chemistry. Um, that, that experience in that fall semester, because I spent too much time bass fishing and not studying, um, I ended up talking to Dr. Garrett, and he said, look, this, this son, you're in the big leagues now. Okay, You're in college. This is your time. What you do at this point is going to set the path for the rest of your life. And either it's your time now or you're just going to go and float away and become another number. So the very next semester, I took organic chemistry um, and did not make a D. Uh, I did a little bit better that time. And he's the one person that totally changed my life and the sole reason uh, that I'm a chemist today. So much so that my five-year-old son's middle name is Garrett. So you find that one person in your life, whether it's a teacher right now in high school, a professor when you come to college, hopefully here to SFA, um, and find that one person that really makes you excited about that field in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You find that one mentor that has, has this impact on you, I promise you, you will not regret it. It's pretty good. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. I grew up in Longview, Texas, so I, I'm, I graduated from Pine Tree High School. I'm an East Texas kid. Um, all I ever wanted to do was play basketball. So I came to SFA because that's where my parents went. And when I got here, I walked on the team and was also a pre-med major. I, you, know, you had to pick something, right? So you pick pre-med. I picked pre-med and math because numbers were easy for me. So I tried to play basketball the first year and, and start that curriculum, which was pretty tough. And what she also found out was, I'm five foot six. I was really good in East Texas. 
But now you're on the national stage, and you know now you beat now you know there are other people that are better. They're taller, they're faster, they're quicker. Um, so I was going to be average at best at the collegiate level. And I also too had a professor my sophomore year in the math department, and she's actually in this room, and that's Dr. Pam Roberson. <laughs> and Dr. Roberson stopped me one day after class and said, "Look, you need to figure out what you're doing here." You know, if you're here to play basketball, play basketball. If you're here to get a math degree, get a math degree. You're not going to do both. Or you're not going to do both well. So that's hard for a 19-year-old kid to hear. But she was right. Didn't, I didn't tell her that at that time, but she was, she was right. Um, so I, I ended up not playing basketball going forward. And, in, well, in a side story, my sophomore year, I was going to play basketball. The coach was Gary Blair who, oh, by the way, is the national champion coach of the Lady Aggies as of last year. Whoop, yeah. So, so yeah, Pam kept me from that, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so I ended up staying at SFA, and I had another professor when I was a senior say, you know, I, I went to him and I said, look, what can I do with this degree that Dr. Roberson taught me into getting? You know, what can I do with this? And he basically said, his name was C.P. Bartner. He has since passed away, but he was the second extreme influence in my life here at SFA. And he said, open up your calculus book, turn it to any page, and read a problem. And we did this. And then he said, lather, rinse, repeat. Let's do this two or three times. So we picked several problems, and we read them. And I, you know, I said, what does this mean? What, what are you telling me? And he said, at the end of the day, Chris... He goes, I'm teaching you how to think. You can do anything you want to do. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go to grad school at A&M. He said, okay. And he picked up the phone and he made a phone call. And he got me into grad school at A&M as a graduate assistant. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, coming to the end of the story. But, I mean, I get to A&M once again. Five foot six, kid from East Texas, in an international school with lots and lots of smart kids. And, you know, I got my master's degree in mathematics. But I didn't do it by myself. I'd pick up the phone on a Tuesday afternoon after I made a 37 on my first test. I picked up the phone and I called back here. And I talked to Dr. Roberson. And I said, I'm the stupidest white kid there is. And she said, when can you be here? And I said, it's Tuesday. I can't get there before 6 o'clock tonight. She said, come on, we'll be here. So I drove from College Station back to Stephen F. Austin several times that semester to get me through a class. They did that. The faculty here did that. So there's a lot to be said for what this college can give you, but there's also a lot to be said for what you can do with a STEM degree. Still didn't know what I was going to do. One of the defense contractors from Dallas came down as a career day, came down. They were hiring, they were interviewing math majors and music majors. I thought that was interesting. So I went. And I said, what are you hiring for? They said, we're hiring software engineers. I said, why don't you hire a computer science major? And they said, because math majors and music majors know how to think. So validation again, that the, the degree that I got opened a lot of doors. So I, at the beginning of the story, I told you I was a financial advisor, right? I started off as a software engineer. And here's what STEM will give you. What STEM gives you is the ability to understand the why. What's the impact? That's the science and the math. What's the impact you can have and what your clients can have and your patients can have? The engineering part is the how. How do you build it? How do you make it happen? What are your choices? You can do both with those degrees. I did, I did both as a software engineer. Got me into marketing. Traveled the world. Did a lot of demonstrations got me into the technology world where I was a software sales person and has got me into the financial services world where I help people determine what they want to do with their money and then I have a really smart team of people that help me manage it. So that's, that's a long story, but it, it started here for me. Another hard story to follow. <laughs> um. I graduated from New Boston, Texas. Uh, Y'all don't know, probably most of you don't know where that is, up near Texarkana. It's a town of about 3,000. Um, what, I guess the person that inspired me to go to college was my dad. Um, he was my high school math teacher. I had him three years in high school. 
So uh, you can imagine, I didn't get away with a lot while I was in high school. I did play a lot of sports, and I did, I did well in school, in high school. My biggest challenging class was my senior year. I had physics from my dad. He hadn't taught physics in several years, and so he was bringing home the book and studying every night so that he could come teach the class with his son in it. And I would come to the class, and I'd listen to my dad teach and, and lecture, and we'd do the problems in class. And I understood it. And he would come the next day, and, you know, where would you do your homework? Well, I don't, you know, no, I didn't do my homework. But half the class, why didn't you all do your homework? I know you didn't even bring your book home, Scott. You, I, you know, well, Dad, I understand it. All right, well, the next week I'd take the test and make an A. <laughs> And it really, it was a, it, to me, it was an eye-opener. My dad worked hard, studied hard to be a teacher, and really enjoyed teaching kids, being around kids all the time. And I realized at that point that I understood my dad was such a good teacher, but didn't know physics that well, but that I just understood it. It clicked for me. So I, I knew then I should go on. And my dad says, you're so much smarter than me. You need to do something other than grow up and go to New Boston and work around here in town. He says, you need to go do something. Uh, so he encouraged me to go to Texas A&M, so I promptly went to Tyler Junior College. And, <laughs> and uh, I went to Tyler Junior College a couple of years, did the pre-engineering, um, but it was, it was still easy. I didn't have to struggle. I didn't have to push myself. Uh, got to A&M, and like Christy said, uh, uh-oh. It was a whole different ball game. So I realized that even though my dad, who I think was one of my best teachers ever, had taught me as much as he thought I could, I never had to struggle. I never had to push myself. And then I went to Tyler Junior College. Same way. I didn't make good grades. Easy. It was easy. It was easy. I got to A&M. In my first semester, I made a 1.9. I made a D in a four-hour class. I dropped my first thermodynamics class. And I was on ScoPro. And... Uh, I didn't know if I was really as smart as I thought I was. Talked to my dad. Talked to one of the professors I had at, at Tyler Junior College who was a, a, a mentor of mine, and they said, you can do it. You just got to learn to study. And so that's my advice to y'all is learn to study in high school because you get to the bigger schools, and uh, SFA is one of those. You get there, and you need to know how to study before you get here. Um, so I went on and got my degree at A&M. I, I ended up uh, my last two semesters on the dean's list because I learned to think. I learned how to study. I didn't learn how to just do homework. Um, so uh, that's my advice to y'all. I, I don't want to stretch this out because I know we got other questions and we may be running a little long. So let's go on. <laughs> that was excellent. Um, you actually answered my next question. What advice would you give to someone who wants to go into your profession? I think every one of you almost answered that, but if you would. In that, 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 that age group, I started drawing um, rockets and motor race cars and airplanes and and was really into, into that kind of stuff, drafting and drawing. I did it just constantly. I uh, thought I wanted to be an architect. I uh, thought I wanted to be an airplane designer. Uh, got to into high school, realized I was good at physics and math. And that was the first time somebody had mentioned, you know, that's, that's what you do is what an engineer does. I said, oh, okay. Yeah, it was a small town. I didn't even know an engineer. Didn't even have a clue what an engineer did. Uh, my first semester after uh, at college, I came home and went to work for International Paper at a sawmill as a second shift utility helper. I worked with the maintenance guys. And I'm out here looking at all this automated equipment, all, and this was a real highly automated sawmill. I mean, it was one of the, the, the first, it had only been built for a couple of years, so at the time it was the most automated sawmill in the world. And I was getting to work out there. It's cool. But I saw all this stuff. Is why do they do it that way? It'd work better if you did it this way. And the maintenance guys would look at me and go, "What? How do you, kid? What are you talking about? Go back. Get, go do what we tell you." That kind of inspired me to know that I could see things and I liked to do, to fix things and make them better. And it was a manufacturing type job. So, got to A and M. You got to declare a major. What do you want to do? I want to be a manufacturing engineer. We don't have that curriculum. Oh well, what's the closest to it? 
mechanical engineering. Okay, I'll do that. And it was a good decision. Uh, mechanical engineering uh, is a very broad, heavy in math and science, uh, design type degree for anything in to, to do with mechanical systems, uh, a lot of um, stuff for airplanes, a lot of stuff for uh, air conditioning, ventilation, uh, pumps, fit right into my scheme of where I wanted to do and what I, what I like to do. And when I graduated, I went right to work for a company and became a manufacturing engineer and ended up here in Nacogdoches. So my advice to you coming out of high school is study math, do well in math, learn to think, and uh, just keep at it. I, there was many opportunities that I could have quit and gone and, and done something else that was a little easier that I didn't have to push myself to. And uh, you just got to, got to be, you got to find that fire inside of you to keep pushing. My advice is pretty simple, and that is the world teaches you to work on your weaknesses. Don't be weak in anything. That's what the world teaches you. I don't believe that. I believe you ought to work on your strengths. If, if everybody in this world worked on their weaknesses, they would be average at best because their strengths never got honed and their weaknesses just moved up to neutral. So my advice to you is if, if you have a, an aptitude for numbers, for engineering, for logic, for thinking, trying to reason things out, if that's something that you're interested in, in and or are good at, that's what you need to hone in on. And the, the STEM disciplines are what give you that. They give you the fundamentals of those things. It's the why and the how. And if you work on that, then you can take it to any industry, as you can see. I mean, I've been in three myself. I mean, it, it, you can take it anywhere. So my advice is just listen to what you're good at and apply yourself in what you're good at and work at getting great at that. And then you can do anything. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll even echo that. I mean, my profession now is is a professor. I'm teaching, right? Um, but I was in, in, in industry as well. But the one thing that I definitely uh, would encourage you to think about is do what you love to do, okay? If you're not having fun, it's going to be very difficult to get up in the morning and, and go to work every day and try to, to do your job if you don't enjoy it, okay? Life is way too short, guys, way, way too short. And you guys have so many more distractions than I had when I was your age. I didn't have an iPhone sitting in my pocket. I didn't have Facebook. I didn't have all these things that were distracting me. You guys have a lot of distractions that you have to deal with as you're trying to go through your education. So stick to what you love to do, okay? And if that's, you know, computer programming or, or gaming or chemistry or math or whatever it is, make sure you enjoy it because that is what's going to give you a very successful career at the end of the day. If you're doing it just because you think you need to do it or what other people are going to think about you or even what your parents think you need to do, um, it's going to be very difficult, I think, down the road. I've always loved chemistry. I've always been a weirdo in that way. But I love doing it, and I love teaching it. Um, and I think that's what gets me up every single day is being able to do what I love to do. So that's the best advice I think I can give you, no matter what profession you want to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my advice would be to start researching the field that you think that you might be interested in and maybe, if possible, go out and speak with some people that are in that field so that you can hear from them uh, the experiences that they've had and see what it might be like for you by the time you get to where they're at. Um, really, I ended up I had a professor ask me, what is the one thing, if I were picking something uh, work-wise, that I would do for free? And out of the categories that we had, software development was the choice that I made because I just enjoy it. And that just follows up with what they've been saying. You need to pick something that you really enjoy because if you don't, it's going to be really tough later on. I concur with everything they've said. I think that you guys, the world is your oyster. You guys have so many more opportunities and, and really uh, 
the, the internet gives you an opportunity to look at careers that most of us on this panel never even consider. Um, other thing I, I say to everyone who's in high school is enjoy your time. You know, do well in school, but enjoy your time there. When you go to college, I was telling my administrative assistant when I walked on campus, it brought joy back to my heart remembering the four years that I was on campus. That was the best four years of my life. I learned so much. I met so many people. Um, and, and I developed into the person I am now from that time. And all of that, your future is based upon what you do right now. And I know it's unfair that you have to make adult decisions that have adult ramifications and you're not there yet, but that's the truth. You do well in school now. Find a career that you think. No one's telling you you have to become a doctor now, but look at medicine, look at mathematics, look at computer science, whatever that is. If you want to be a plumber, that's great. Go after it. Go after it with everything you have and enjoy your life. One of the panelists said, we only have a, a certain amount of time here on this, on this planet, and you must enjoy, you must make the best you can of it while you're here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what you need to do as far as going into the engineering profession, but <clears throat> regardless of what you go into, as we have found in our line of work, and I think this applies to any job or vocation that you want to spend your life doing, is you do it to the best of your ability with the right attitude. We get people in all the time uh, that we've hired, and they're probably very good, smart people to do engineering, but if they don't have the right attitude, it doesn't last. And that's real important no matter what you go into. If, if you like what you're doing, in all likelihood, you're going to have a better attitude about it, and it'll make you want to learn more and do better. So that's the one thing you've got to remember. Once you've decided what you want to go into, uh, go after it wholeheartedly and have the right attitude about it because you're going to fall and you're going to have problems. Uh, you know, everybody up here has taken college courses that just creamed us, uh, and we had to go back and do better the next time. Uh, but everybody that's at the college has the same issue, even though you may not think so. Uh, you have to work really hard when you, go, when you go off to college. You've got to learn how to study, how to retain the material, and how to apply it in a practical way if you're in engineering as I do. As far as what you need to look for in my line of work, civil engineering, uh, one of the reasons I went into it is because I could work just about anywhere. Uh, where I lived, where I had a family was important to me. That was just one of my priorities. And I wanted to work somewhere where I could almost pick and choose where I worked. And so I went into private business. Uh, it's definitely not easy. A lot of demands on your time. Um, you're not working 24-7, but there's a lot of demands that you really can't schedule for. Things that just come up and you have to take care of them. And you have to learn how to weigh out between your job and your family, and that's, and that's a pretty, that's, I think that's another question she's going to be asking here in a second, but that's also something to consider. Uh, but if you go into engineering, I would highly recommend it. Right now, there's a shortage of engineers in this country, if you, if you didn't know that. Uh, and I think it's pretty much in every engineering discipline. It's not just civil, it's mechanical. Um, it could probably even be uh, aeronautical. There's nuclear engineering, which is probably not a very high demand anymore. The petroleum engineering, there's all branches. Electrical engineering, there's a huge deficiency in electrical engineers, especially in this region of the state. Uh, I think there's two that I know of in this whole area, and they get all the work. They're doing great, but we sure could use more. Thank you. I do have one more question, but I'd like to turn it over to the audience right now. You've had some time to listen to these wonderful panelists. Do you have any questions for them? Just raise your hand and I'll come to you with the microphone. So, any questions that you might ask? There's got to be one. Ah, we have a taker. Okay. <laughs> How many years do you have to do college for? How many years um, of college do you need to work in your profession? Um, that's a lot of them. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I did four years of undergrad, so I went to the University of Denver, 
And then I, I did four years of medical school. And I did an additional five years of uh, surgery residency. Then I did one additional year of fellowship. So it was a total of 14 years. But I want to stop you on that. I heard somebody say, Phew, 14 years is a small amount of time to do what I enjoy doing every day. It's a sm it's, it flew by like that. The last eight really flew by. But, you know, so 14 years, some professions, neurosurgeries, they, some of those guys go 18 years, 20 years of complete training after high school. The question was, what subjects should she focus on if she would like to be a veterinarian major at A&M? The only reason I can address this is because my roommate was a veterinarian. Um, not because I went through it. Um, probably any, you can go into animal science. Uh, that's one means by, you can try to get into the vet school over there. Um, but of the, of the veterinarians that I went to school with that were in school at the time, and they're not all practicing veterinarians, uh, most of them went into, into biology, um, and, uh, and or chemistry or both. Uh, one thing you're going to have to remember when you go in over there, uh, the competition has gotten pretty heavy. And um, as I understand it now, uh, they may have 1,200 applications every time they have another semester, but they only accept about 100. So you're looking at about 10% or a little less. So it, it's one of those things where everything that my roommates did and watching them uh, and what the people that I know that went through vet school, even some, some current people that are going through vet school, is you need to work really hard on your grades. That's a big deal. That, that's, a, that's almost the sole selection criteria through their vet school. Is uh, What they're telling me now is if you don't have at least a 3.9, you won't get in. So you're going to have to have bir virtually perfect grades. So... When you go in, just work real hard. It's a great school. Uh, my roommate was extremely smart. He's a really good veterinarian. Right now, I work for an uh, electrical supply company, and um, we do a lot of development for shipping, account inquiry, uh, those types of programs. Also, uh, a lot of inventory programs. I've worked for EDS, for General Motors Assembly Plant. While I was there, we did a lot of VB on top of PLC. Uh, we were controlling a lot of the conveyors through software development. Um, just, those are just to give a few examples. The question is, what should he do if he would like to prepare uh, to work in a field of organic chemistry? Yeah. Organic chemistry. I guess that's for me. Um, uh, so organic chemistry depends, to be honest. There's the, organic chemistry is such a broad field, and it's a great field because you get to go into a whole bunch of different areas, right? There's a, there's a whole new paradigm being developed for, for alternative energy sources and being able to, to work in, an, in a better capacity for solar energy and these kind of things, organic chemists get to play in that area. Organic chemists do a lot in drug discovery. Organic chemists do a lot in polymer development. So it depends on where your passion is, but you, obviously if you want to go into organic chemistry, you'll start at a place like SFA, which would be a great opportunity. Uh, you'll become a chemistry major, and you'll be introduced to organic chemistry in your sophomore year, okay? So you got to have a great foundation in your freshman chemistry classes. Hopefully you've got some chemistry in high school as well that will expose you to that a little bit. Awesome. And, and then your organic chemistry will be in your second year, your sophomore year, and then you'll move into more focused classes um, that will involve analytical chemistry, inorganic chemistry. It rounds you out. You need all these other classes as well. 
But once you get to college, what I'm going to tell you is if you want to focus in organic chemistry and eventually go into graduate school in organic chemistry like I did and, and get a PhD or a master's degree, then that's where you can really focus into organic chemistry and really fine tune which area you want to go into, whether it's polymer chemistry or, or some of the nanotechnology or some, some drug synthesis, these kind of things. Graduate school is where you can focus yourself, but it all is going to start with your foundation uh, in college and being a chemistry major, okay? You've got to get the basics and the foundation down. In organic chemistry, and I'm sure um, our doctor on our panel here is, is feared by some people um, when it comes to that class because it's a different type of chemistry that most people have never seen before. It's a, it's a very visual chemistry. Um, and so it is, it is something once you get on a campus that a lot of people say, oh my gosh, organic chemistry is very difficult. Don't let them scare you, okay? Fight the good fight. All right? Does that help? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, for our medical professional, we have um, why would you want to kill cancer cells as opposed to change them into what you would like them to be? So why would you want to kill cancer instead of... T wow, that's probably ab above my pay grade. <laughs> You know, when, when you look at cancer, you know, it's a part of your body that's gone wrong. And when, <clears throat> by the time I find it, you know, it's just for me to cut it out. You know, the, the, the real smart people, the ones in the, the chemists and the biologists, those who are on the microbiology level, those microscopic levels, they're trying to figure out ways how to do that. You know, I don't see that. I kind of read about it and maybe the, I just want to read the conclusion. Because all this stuff is too, too, uh, too smart for me to kind of figure out. You know, I think that it's important, the stem cells and all that, figuring it out. But for me as a surgeon, you know, they send it to me and say it needs to come out. And, you know, I get a knife and we go to work. Okay. Sorry to have a better answer for you. We have another question. What is it like to be an athlete and go to college? For me, it was great. I mean, I looked at my grades. If I went back through the four years of college, my grades were better during basketball season because I was so structured. I knew every day practice from the time I hit campus in September until mid-March when the tournament was over. I was going to be in that gym every day from 2 to 7 every day. So I knew when I got home, I had to eat and I would study. You know, the travel we did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give that up for anything. If you have a love for sports, and for me, it went back to high school. On top of it, it, it paid for me to be able to go to college. You know, so I, I was, it wasn't overwhelming, but you have to be disciplined. There were other guys who didn't study and, and they, they suffered. But, you know, from my high school roots, I understood if I was going to play, I had to, to, to do well in a class. I was a student athlete. Student was first. There were times where I may have to miss class, miss uh, practice. You know, some you know, there were some classes that required more of me. Coach, I, I'm going to be late. Or I need to leave early. There were times I had labs as a biology major. If practice went to 7 and class started at 6.30, I left because I was a student first. But for me, it was well worth it. I wouldn't take, change anything about it. For our panelists on the end, you mentioned earlier that you worked for the military. What exactly did you make? I worked for Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is the biggest defense contractor in the United States. Um, it's, it's also possibly the biggest defense contractor in the world. Um, we build... Electron, what I build in Lufkin, we build electronics for four different missile systems. Um, all of them are used by the Army. Two of them are, are considered air defense missiles. Um, I don't know if some of you have studied much about the uh, Desert Storm and uh, Iraqi Freedom, but uh, we build the missile, it's called the Patriot Missile, that goes up and knocks down incoming missiles from the enemies who are shooting at our, you know, the areas we're defending. It's a shorter range missile, but it's, a, it's called hit-to-kill technology. 
Um, other products we make are what's called a THAAD missile, Theater High Altitude Air Defense Missile. It actually can go up and hit an intercontinental ballistic missile coming in at the top in, in, in lower space, I'd, I'd call it. Um, and the technology of those two missiles is called hit-to-kill technology. It, um, it is shooting a bullet with a bullet. You've got an incoming missile that's coming at 12,000 miles an hour. That's how fast you've got to go to get into orbit. So any, any kind of ballistic missile that's got into orbit is going at least 12,000 miles an hour. And we've got to shoot it with a missile while it's going that fast. It's just a, it's really some, some neat technology, a lot of radar, a lot of communication, high-speed communications. Um, just kind of a little antidote, antidote whatever you call it. <laughs> the first quad processor, y'all have got them in your phones now. The first quad processor was built for the Patriot Missile System. We designed it. We bought processors from Texas Instruments, developed the software and the circuit cards so that we could run four of them simultaneously to do the calculations to be able to send a missile up and knock in and knock out an incoming missile. We hit it nose to nose. We've never missed. We've never missed. It's amazing to me that we've never missed. Uh, and um, the other two missiles that we make are a surface to surface missile that the military uses. And uh, all, of, all of them now start, are going to uh, GPS technology, stuff you use in your phone, you use in your car. The military designed that. Companies like Lockheed Martin, NEC, EDS, they design those. They need engineers that can design that stuff. And, and you're using that stuff every day that was stuff that was developed for the military. Does that answer your question, I think? Okay. <laughs>